Welcome, friends. This is Scott Ritzema with Dr. Leela Lewis of Liberty and Health Alliance. And we just came off a spiritually powerful event. We want to tell you some stories about that. Controversies ensued. God overcame, which is just what he does. So I'm joined with Dr. Leela Lewis, president of Liberty and Health Alliance. Dr. Leela, I know you've been doing health ministry a long time. This is one in a long string of mega clinics and events like this in the big cities. I want to go back to earlier in your ministry before we tell some of the stories from Washington, D.C. and the miracles that have ensued. Tell us about, the, you, you, you shared a story that to me was like a feeding of the 5,000 type of story. And I wanted our audience to hear that because I don't think you've told that since we've been doing these streams. Could you tell us about early on what happened with your Sabbath magazines? Absolutely. And before we do that, uh, Scott, do you mind if we open with prayer? Yes, we had our prayer, and we always prayed the technology would go well, but let's have a prayer with the audience as well. Father in heaven, we want to pause right now and recognize you, your son Jesus, is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, and we want to see your name glorified. We pray that all those listening would, would see you more clearly for who you are and what you are doing in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, yes, thank you for asking that question, Scott. So, it was a long time ago. Uh, my now 22 year old little baby was literally, well, she's a big lady now, but she was a tiny baby. She was about about a year old. So it was about 20, 21 years ago. And, um, and we had the very first event. I had never done health ministry before. It was the health booth at the Arizona State Fair. I didn't know what I was doing. I had not even finished my internship after medical school. I had my baby in the backpack and we had a number of people that were volunteering all over from the state of Arizona at this little booth at the Arizona State Fair. Now, how we even got the booth was a complete miracle. I won't have time to tell you that, but God made it very clear that this was the direction that he wanted us to go. And interestingly enough, it was my father, myself, and baby Hadassah that went to the government office to get that first approval that God granted. Well, it was the last night of the Arizona State Fair and I had to take my little one home. It was around, I think I left around 7 p.m. The fair booth stayed open till about 10. And after I left, there were other volunteers that continued to volunteer there. Now, mind you, we weren't doing anything like the mega clinics. It was a 10 by 10 booth. We had different pieces of literature. There was the great controversy. There was a magazine, my three main magazines that I knew God had miraculously wanted there because of some other instances that had happened before were uh, heritage magazines. And they were a love stronger than death, which talks about what happens when you die. Uh, the Sabbath magazine, which is called the time for joy and radiant living on health. And those three magazines amongst all the other literature, but those three magazines were on the front table right in the middle was the sabbath magazine a time for joy now i had left like i said and there were three people working the booth and all of a sudden they realized oh no they still had about two and a half hours before the booth finally closed that last night but they ran out of sabbath magazines and they looked all over the booth they looked under the tables they looked everywhere there were none nowhere to be found and so they stopped and they had prayer and they said, Lord, you know, please help us to, you know, find some magazines. And when they opened their eyes right in the exact same spot where the Sabbath magazines always sat, which was right in the middle between the other two magazines, plus all the other literature and the blood pressure cuffs and those kinds of things. But right in the middle was a stack of Sabbath magazines about this thick. And that's they're like, what, wait, wait, wait a minute. Who found the Sabbath magazines? Oh, I was praying. You knew that. Well, no, somebody had to find the Sabbath. Magazine. Somebody put them here. Nobody put them there. And I believe, as did they, that an angel placed that stack of Sabbath magazines there. And that stack continued to last until the last minute of the fair. Well, that was a pretty clear indication to me that this is the direction God wanted us to go. There were other indications as well, but that one was clearly God wanted this to go forward. But God also made it very clear that last night of the fair that there would be whatever I embarked upon, there would be a big fight in this medical evangelism, sharing Christ's love with the world. There was a lady that came by. It was only about 30 minutes left of the booth there at the Arizona State Fair the last night. It was 2002. And the lady walked by, a very nicely dressed woman, and she began to ask for every single piece of literature that was at the booth. 
And she took a great controversy and she took each one of the magazines and she took each one of the other items there and kept asking, who is behind this? Oh, the organization we called at the time, Right Arm of Love. Oh, it's Right Arm of Love. No, but who's really behind it? Is there a person? Is there an individual? They didn't say any names. They just said, well, would you, you know, would you like anything else? Finally, one of the gentlemen said to her, oh, I like your scrunchie and your hair. My wife would like that. And she said, oh, well, if you give me your address, I'll be happy to mail your wife one. And so he gave her the address. Right after that, she said to him, um, oh, well, thank you so much. And they, he was, she, they were about to leave or she was about to leave. And he said, well, by the way, you know, who are you and where, where are you from? And she said, oh, well, I'm head legal counsel for the Archdiocese of, of Arizona. And he says, oh, I see. And so what that said to me, that very first, that last night of the very first event that I ever embarked upon in mega health outreach evangelism was God wants his work, his beautiful love message, which is intertwined. It's integrally intertwined with gospel and medical work to go forward. But when we do this, there would be a fight such as we've never seen before and that we must persevere by the faith and grace and power of God if we want God to overrule. And that's what I learned from that very first event. I want you to tell some of the stories about the persevering that had to happen in this recent DC event in a moment. But first, I love this in that story how God wants to feed the people with spiritual food. These events are not merely for a humanitarian aim. They are that, just to love people no matter where they're at. But more importantly, to love their their eternity, their eternal life, their spiritual needs. So meeting the physical and the spiritual side by side, and God provided and continues to provide. Um, I want to hear more stories. Miracles have happened in recent weeks. But first, before we go there, can you please update our listeners on what the needs are to make sure events like this can continue to happen? We want to be building uh, financial reserves to be able to go into the next event. So what are the needs from the previous and what's coming as the Lord continues to lead? So thank you for asking that, Scott. So we still need uh, quite a bit of money, a lot of bills, and you're going to hear why in just a few minutes happened unexpectedly at the last minute, uh, us requiring, and you're going to hear why, to get an additional tent, which was a miracle of God in the end, but it cost more money. Uh, there were licensure fees. Uh, there were additional equipment fees that all happened at the last minute. So we still have quite a number of expenses that need to be covered. I'm saying this not, Lila, but I'm calling it sabotage of the devil. God overruled it. You can agree or disagree or pass, but get back to the nuts and bolts of those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. It was a sabotage of the devil. Absolutely. But um, but then we also, you know, this what I learned from this event, and I can't wait to share how God worked so mightily. But what I learned from this event is it strengthened my faith. It strengthened me to push forward, to persevere. And that there are so many big cities around this country and even around the world and there is no one or two or three people, Ellen White says in a Ministry of Healing, that can finish this great work. We must work together. We must collectively work together. But it's going to cost us a lot of money. But God has the money on a thousand hills. We know that it all belongs to him. So I'm not worried about that. But as we see this great need and we see the importance of pressing forward, we are in need of additional funds. And so I would say in order to cover past expenses, but also to be able to plan to take this to the masses in the next city, wherever God would have us go, we, we need more resources for sure. And when you go to libertyandhealth.org and put that, that donation in, put, put in the memo line the, the big city you think it should go next. And we can't make any promises, but, you know, cast your vote. We're going to be praying about that. I want to take us back to the controversy between Christ and Satan. DC isn't the first time you've engaged in this spiritual warfare. Take us back to 2014. That was kind of a game changer. Tell us that story. So it was, so I told you a little bit about Right Arm of Love, and then I had the blessing and uh, privilege of forming another organization. And this ended up being called Bridges to Health, which later on became called Pathway to Health. But so this was the first event there in San Francisco and Oakland. 
God made it very clear he wanted something bigger, something different than the, quite frankly, that had ever been done before. And so we were going to put on a large scale, what we now know as mega clinics had never been done before, large scale medical dental vision in, combi in combination with providing people's lifestyle, but most importantly, their spiritual needs. And so there we were in San Francisco, God worked unbelievable miracles even leading up to it, but it was the night before that first event. In fact, it was 4.45 on a Friday, or no, it was a, yes, it was a Friday afternoon on 4.40, at 4.45 p.m. And I got a call, I was in Oakland coming across the Oakland Bridge. For those of you who know the area, you cannot get across there in any sort of short length of time. And I got a call that the sheriff's office was shutting us down. Our people were already en route. They were already showing up for Sabbath to plan to set up on Sunday and start the clinic. There was no way to get out of this situation. But I was being told that the sheriff was shutting us down. And I had my first experience of darting prayers to heaven. Lord, help us, help us. Please help us. And I get on the phone with the sheriff. I said, sir, is there any way that I could get to you and talk to you in person? He says, okay, fine. We'll wait for you for a few minutes. Well, they ended up waiting. And somehow, miraculously, I can't say how, we got across the Oakland Bridge. We got over there, went into the sheriff's office, described to him in person, which was nothing short of God speaking through us, through his Holy Spirit. The next thing I know, the sheriff who was shutting us down, said, okay, I'm going to allow this to happen. I think I do want this to happen. I invited him to come to the train, the last celebration training session that night at one of the local Seventh-day Adventist churches. The gentleman came, and instead of shutting us down, the sheriff told all the volunteers, which was actually live-streamed, and the people on the internet, how much he supported God's Seventh-day Adventist church people in giving to his community. And from there, God did unbelievable miracles, Oak, San Francisco and Oakland happened and it completely changed, entirely changed the perspective that we as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, have looked at how to do medical missionary work since that time. Amen. And, you know, when when people see the work of God happening, they give glory to him and they they name that remnant church of Bible prophecy. And I know of a major mayor who said, you know what, one thing, one problem I have with you, Seventh-day Adventists, is you're, you're not, you're hiding this light under the bushel too much, so to speak. Those weren't his exact words, but it was basically, you ought to be more prominent with the message and mission you have because of how powerful it is. Now, people want to hear about all of the miracles and, and, and obstacles overcome from D.C., from this month. So you mentioned tents. What was the issue with the tents, with the licensure, with the financials, the the, the providers? Um, there were many fleeces, many times where I know it was a question mark of whether the event could go forward, whether the devil was going to have the last word. And we just have to knock the dust off of our feet and say, I guess the Lord's given this place over. But he had the last word. Um, I, I know an entire book could be written just about the D.C. event. So truncate all of that down to the most succinct. I know give, take take five minutes to unpack it because people got to hear some of these details. But give us the give us the bullet points and the highlights. Well, thank you for that, Scott. I'll do my very best. Yes, it was. Um, there are so many miracles that happen. It's going to be hard to condense it down, but I will do my very best. And as I mentioned and God made it very clear to me way back when I first started medical missionary work that this would be a fight. There's no question this would be a fight. And that's exactly what we saw in D.C. So condensing it down, suffice it to say, right off the bat, we begged and pled God, please, Lord, please give us a venue. Give us an inside venue. And everybody just kept saying, the only location you have is the RFK Arena in tents. And we said, no, God. We can't do this in tents. We can't do medical missionary with procedures and exams and all these things that we do in tents. How are we going to be cool enough? We can't do it. And furthermore, it's going to cost us a fortune. And God made it so clear. In fact, one morning, I'll never forget, we all have our special time with Jesus. And my special time with Jesus is first thing in the morning, I, I 
meet with him before I get out of bed. I don't even want to get out of bed. It's like my special time under my covers, talking to Jesus and reading, etc. And so this particular morning, I was earnestly pleading, Lord, give us a venue. And there were so many of us praying, Lord, give us a venue. Of course, we meant a venue inside. And that particular morning, as I was pleading with Jesus, all of a sudden, in that little thought in my mind, we say still small voice, Jesus says in the Bible, but you know that voice, it was just right there in my mind. Why are you still asking for a venue? I've already given you a venue. And it was such a calm, yet authoritative, reassuring voice. I was like, Layla, what are you doing? And I knew right then and there, this is what God wanted. And so speed forward. So all of a sudden, God says we're supposed to be intense. This is way back at the beginning of February. How in the world are we supposed to afford tents? How are we supposed to get licensure? That was a whole nother issue. The District of Columbia had told us no out-of-state licensure whatsoever. We came into April 1. We still didn't even have permission to have any sort of event from the District of Columbia. We took three days of fasting and prayer. I know, Scott, you were part of that. This was our fleece before God. Lord, if we don't have an answer by April 1, we don't want to presumptuously continue to spend money and have people take time off work and all these things that were happening. Maybe this is just you saying the door is closed. April 1. God doesn't do it before April 1. He waits until April 1 and he opens the windows of heaven and all of a sudden we're given full licensure for almost all of the requests that we had. Okay, Lord, there's fleece number one. You clearly made it abundantly evident. You want us to proceed. You gave us these licensure opportunities. Then we come against the finances. And you remember this one, Scott, remember this? You, myself, and Jonathan Zirkel, we did an appeal for the people. We said, okay, this will be our fleece. And everybody was praying again. And the fleece was, if we come up, God provides us $70,000, which was only going to be half of what it cost to purchase the first tent. But we said, okay, this will be our fleece. We don't have the money for it. But if God provides $70,000 by Friday, we filmed on Sunday, then we'll know that this is the Lord's will. And we made that video, as you'll remember, on Sunday God gives us, before, and again, we, we filmed on Sunday, but we didn't release it. We weren't even planning to release it until later in the week. And so we filmed on Sunday. $10,000 came in the same day. Then two days later, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to anyone and everyone, $50,000 comes in out of nowhere from the most miraculous way. And then even before we released the video on Friday, another 10,000 came in. God literally gave us the $70,000 before we even released the video on Friday. It was unbelievable, as you remember. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Is Scott. the controversy over at that point? I mean, oh, Department no. of Health, no, the Friday no. before. No, there was, there was still more. There was still more. So we had... We had, now we had the licensure and then God gave us the clear money. But then all of a sudden the devil was like, yeah, no, you guys think things are coming along too easy. I'm going to pull all of your ties with Washington, D.C. And so out of the blue, out of nowhere, all of our relationship ties or so what we thought were our relationship ties to provide us with the local physicians and dentists that were required because we had to have DC licensed providers in order to bring out of state providers, they all were cut instantaneously. It was the most unusual thing ever. It was May, the first week of May. I was supposed to fly out there. As you'll remember, we published videos about this, fly out there and go and meet different people. And now what were we supposed to do? Our team, yet again, earnestly pled with God, Lord, what should we do? And in my heart, I'll be honest, in my heart, I was kind of relieved. I was sick and tired of this fight. I'm like, look, I have my own issues with work. I have my own issues with my kids, family life, you name it. I, it was happening to me outside. And I know the same thing was happening to many of our other volunteers. And so in a way, I was kind of relieved. I was like, well, Lord, I guess, uh, I guess the event's not going to take place. And in my mind, I was kind of like, Thank the Lord, I don't want to do this event. This is too much controversy. And then in the back of my mind, I felt impressed. Leela, 
what if this is the devil? What if yet again, the devil is just about to win and we're not persevering and we're not allowing God to do what God wants to do. And so I humbly took myself out of my little, this is all about me mode. And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I said, if you want this to happen, I will do everything in my power, even though I don't want to. I will go to DC. I have no connections there. I will go. In fact, it ended up being us because Stacy Martin offered to come too. And we went door to door, literally knocking on doors, asking for people to sponsor this event. And the last day there, God made it abundantly clear. As you know, each night we were having fasting and prayers with Jesus every day. And that last day, God made it so clear. This was the third fleece. And at that point, our executive officers, as you'll remember, made a decision. We will not put any more fleeces before God. God has made it clear, no matter how difficult the fights of the devil are, we will go forward by his grace and his power. And we did. Scott, back to you. Now, I want our listeners to really think about the fact that these aren't just stories. This is about your life. When you see perseverance in the spirit with a group of people who are mission minded, take heart and inspiration from that, that that is of God and from God and can work through you as well. I mentioned a moment ago, Department of Health, Friday before the week of the event. I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the feed, some of the back and forth. So, Dr. Leela, I want you just to take this and roll with it straight through, spill the beans, all the story from here on. What happened literally the weekend before the event? How did the devil try to shut this down and what did God do? Well, thank you for that, Scott. Yes, it was unbelievable. So we had actually flown in. We had just landed in Dulles. We are, our luggage was still on the plane. We were trying to get it down. And as you know, for those of you with children, sometimes getting off a plane with kids, with luggage, it takes a little extra time. And so there we were, and my phone rang. It was actually my mother, and she was calling to say that the event DC people were meeting with the mayor's office, and they were shutting down our event. Now, it was 4.30 on the afternoon of Friday afternoon, very similar to what had happened in 2014. And so I'm being told this. I said, what? What is going on? How can this be possible? I got a hold of the event DC people at 445, right before close of business on a Friday afternoon. And sure enough, the Department of Health Services had indicated that they were shutting us down. I sent a massive text to our prayer, LHA prayer team, which was the bones, the skeleton of holding the arms of this event up in prayer before God throughout months of pre-work. Pray. We must pray right now. I barely had them on the phone because the gentleman at Event DC said he would be calling me back if he was able. I got them on the phone. I told them a little bit was going on. And all of a sudden, my phone rang again. And it was the government. I said, I'm sorry, guys. Keep praying. Pray earnestly. I have to take this call. And so I flipped over. I took the call. And without my even awareness, the next thing I know, I'm on the phone with like 25 or 30 government people on a call at five o'clock in the afternoon, on a Friday afternoon of all things. And they said, you know what, for this and this and this and this and this reason, we're not going to allow place. It's not humanly possible for you to be able to complete this within the next few days. And we're just gonna shut the whole thing down. I said, dear Jesus, please help. I'm darting prayers to heaven again, because over the years I had learned, as I already mentioned, how important it is to pray in the midst of controversy, especially when you feel the devil pushing back so hard. And so I'm darting prayers to heaven. And then I ask, I said, would it be possible for you to consider to give us till Monday to provide all of this information that you're asking for? And the gentleman said, well, we'll have a meeting after this. I said, but please, sir, please consider the fact. And my, my voice was actually breaking. I said, please consider the fact that many, many people have already given up of their time, the resources, we're a volunteer organization. All we wanna do is help your city to do that. He says, line after this conversation and we'll decide if we'll give you until Monday or not. I again send a message to the prayer team, pray now, pray hard. They're making a decision whether or not they're even gonna give us till Monday. 
15 minutes goes by. It's 5.15 on a Friday afternoon. I get a call from the government official from the Department of Health Services. And he says, yes, we have decided we will give you time to produce all of this information. But we just want you to know it's pretty much going to be humanly impossible for that to happen. I was praising God. Our prayer team was praising God. But as many of you know, you received an SOS notice. Please pray. The event is in jeopardy. In fact, the, the entire event looks like it's going to be shut down. Meanwhile, that wasn't the only controversy the devil threw at us. At the same moment that all of this is going down, we got a notice from the Department of Building that as we had planned for months to set up on that Sunday, to set the tents up, we didn't to set the building permit up for the tents either. Well, we come into the event. It's Friday night. We send out the SOS. We're begging everyone to pray. Sabbath, by faith, we still went out and handed out invitations to the event. Sunday, we worked from morning until 2 o'clock in the morning working on the documents. And then it was unbelievable. We finished the documents at 2 a.m. And then I got up at 5 a.m. and was re-editing and trying to submit the documents because it had to be received before 9 a.m. I pushed the email send. It would send through the email, but through their portal, it would not submit. I could not get it submitted. The next morning was the first day of the tour. And I personally wanted to go on that tour. Scott, you were one of the speakers. I wanted to listen. And I, it looked like I wasn't going to get to go. I got to go to the Ford Theater while I was sitting there. Everything was breaking loose. This was Monday morning. It was just before 9. They still hadn't received the documents. When they did receive the document, I was sitting there listening to the Ford Theater presentation. And oh, how I wanted to hear it. But while I was listening to the gentleman present, I looked at my phone and the DOH rejected our application. Now I said, dear Lord, help. And I just felt this overwhelming impression, get out of here. You must go to the DOH, get out of here. Now, Scott, I did not want to miss you guys' presentations, but I felt like the entire event, there were already a hundred people there for the tour and they were all for volunteers. How many more were coming in? I had to get out. And so we left, we went straight over to the Department of Health Services without an appointment. And as we were driving there, all of a sudden I felt this impression in my mind bring them flowers, go stop, get them flowers, bring them flowers and tell them how sorry you are for any inconvenience you may have caused them. <laughs> and that was kind of a strange thought, wasn't it, Scott? Would you not say? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, maybe, maybe not expected. No, it wasn't expected. It was a little unusual. But in fact, I even sent that to my prayer team and they're like, I think you better just go, Leela, as yourself and just take you and Jesus. But I just felt this impression. No, Jesus wanted me to, to meet them, you know, and, and provide something as a token to tell them that we cared about them. I showed up with my three little bouquets of flowers. I notified through security that I was there. And mir miraculously, the woman came downstairs unannounced, uninvited, if you will. She took me upstairs. The next thing I know, there are seven of all of the head directors for the entire Department of Health unannounced, unplanned, all in one boardroom with myself. We talked for an hour and a half, over an hour and a half. And by the end of it, the frowns that started were smiles. In fact, the one lady who was the most antagonistic, when I gave her that bouquet of flowers, at first she was just frowning. And I said, you know, I just wanted to let you know, I am so sorry for any inconvenience that we've caused you. And we just, we just want to work with you and figure out how we can work together to help the citizens of the District of Columbia. And her frown kind of went to a straight line. But by the end of that hour and a half, her frown had gone from a straight line to a smile. And so I knew God was working. And that's what I was able to report to the volunteers that night, Scott. And at that moment when you were there, uh, about that moment, I had the, the, the message at the National Museum of American History and it just dawned on me, part of that message was the history of eugenics and Planned Parenthood and the abortion movement. And I'm thinking about this particular city 
and the ideological uh, leanings. And are they, on average, um, inclined to welcome and be friendly to those who have a viewpoint of liberty and who are Bible-believing Christians and believe in the lives of the unborn? I mean, you know God is parting reds. He's here. So what happened next? Well, it was unbelievable. So I, I was anticipating, they told me, I heard from the director, that I should receive, not I, we as a group. We're a family, right? Liberty and Health Alliance, we are. And after this event, I feel so close to our family. We really are one big, beautiful family. So our family was to receive a notice from the Department of Health Services, he indicated, of an acceptance or allowance. Now, this was now Monday late afternoon. Around this time, I get a call from my father, Mr. George Gilbert, who I just want to say a shout out to my parents and particularly my father and my brother for working nonstop. And, and I mean, this we, we would not have been able to do any of this had it not been for my parents and my brother. But my father, who was directing the men on site to set these tents up, called me and said, you know what, Leela? We have been sold and received licensure for tents that don't exist. What? I said. Well, the tents that we submitted to the Department of Health or Department of Building were rectangular tents. That's what the, the plan showed. But the tents actually are oval. And as a result of the oval shape, you're going to lose a lot of square footage and you're not going to be able to serve all of, provide all the services that you wanted to be able to provide. In fact, one in particular, the radiology department was going to be entirely cut off. And you're going to find out why that was such an important department in just a minute. And I said, well, we can't do that. This, this can't be. Leela, you cannot get permits in one day. Tomorrow is Tuesday. It takes weeks, if not months, sometimes years to get permits from the Department of Building. I said, we better pray really hard. So the next thing I know, I'm just like our prayer team is praying like crazy for this issue. Tuesday, I desperately wanted to go on the tour. It was the one thing I really wanted to do, which was the White House tour in the Capitol. Oh, how I wanted to go. I got on the bus. We went to the White House. And yet again, everything was falling loose with the Department of Building. We're in the middle of the White House tour. Scott. You guys were there. I was never able to listen to your presentations because the whole time my phone is blowing up. We don't, we cannot set these tents up. We don't have licensure to do so. I left the White House yet again, cold turkey call, the Department of Building. But this time God provided a Daniel, one of the individuals. Remember I told you we went out by faith and handed out flyers on Sabbath, even though we had no permits and no ability to proceed on Sunday. One of the flyers of one of the houses actually went to one of the councilman's associates. And that particular associate, I call, he called me on the phone and he said, if you have anything you need, you contact me. I called him. I said, we have a building permit issue. He called the director of the Department of Building. The next thing I know, when I walk in cold turkey to the Department of Building, all of a sudden, four of the highest level officials for the District of Columbia, for the Department of Building, come out. They listen to the situation. Not only did we have to get relicensure on two tents, we had to get a brand new license on a whole new tent so that we could be able to still provide all the services that we need. And do you know what those gentlemen and ladies actually did? It was nothing short of God. This was Tuesday afternoon, late afternoon. They pushed the Department of Building permits through such that by the next morning, Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., when we're already putting the equipment in, the tents are already up, we get the building permit. And they said, we want you to go forward. At the last minute, God overruled and overruled and overruled again. It's powerful. Um, one of the highlights of the whole experience comes in that evening before the event is to begin if if i'm pushing you ahead too far fill in the gaps but i want to take you to wednesday night what news comes in what happens with the rain and i'm gonna you know what i mean there to, well, I, I i want to tell you from my perspective when you get done with that about the 
prayer, the prayer meeting and, and my family's experience with that. But tell us about that. So it was now, now it's Wednesday afternoon, first thing, 7 a.m. Thursday morning, the event is supposed to start. We had already been told we had received for a licensure from the Department of Health Services, although never had received anything in writing. And then, of course, God had miraculously given us the building permit that morning. And so we thought everything was great. All of a sudden, it's close of business right before close of business. I think it was 442 to be exact, because I saw that and I could not believe it. I looked at my phone and the Department of Health Services had excluded us from laboratory services, dental extractions, and any surgical procedures. And we called an emergency prayer meeting. We pulled everyone that were working so hard in all of their different areas to set the event up. We all came under that big tent, as you remember, Scott, and it started to rain. It started to rain and you take it from here. Tell us what we did under that tent. It was the most powerful prayer meeting that I've ever been a part of. It was a call to urgent pleading with our sovereign God to have his will be done. And it's not even so much the outcome that counts here. It's the very presence of the Holy Spirit. It was marked. We broke into groups of four or five. We were pleading with the Lord to move. And I, I can tell you that the, the, somebody was given a voice to speak in ways that we could sing and hear in this very you know, difficult uh, uh, acoustic place with some of the contractors banging away in the background. And I, I just, I sense the Holy Spirit in that. And then in the prayer groups, and then I was to give the, 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 the closing prayer to welcome everybody back from their groups. And I've just never had a, a perception of the Spirit of God like in that, in that prayer. And I asked my kids, my family was at this one. My wife was running the children's department and my, my boys were volunteering there and in logistics. And I said, was that not powerful boys? They're uh, 13 and 10. And one of the two boys said, dad, I don't think that was really from you, your prayer. And when we were in our groups and when, when the closing prayer was had, I felt the warmth, I felt warmth around me. And, you know, we don't just go on sensations and so on, but sometimes God gives you a marked notation of his presence where it is palpable. And I just found that to be beautiful, knowing that this was God's work. And then he gave us a little token, didn't he? Not a little token. There, <laughs> yeah. was, there was a lady, actually. Um, I'm going to say her name because she she is actually a prayer warrior. Her name is Miss Gloria Wilson. And the, the very fact that she was even there was a miracle of God. And I won't take the time to explain it. But she was specifically praying that God would indicate his covenant his plan that he was with us by giving us a rainbow around our tent and that the rainbow would touch down on either side of the tent. All of a sudden, at the end of this prayer, this, this, I would agree with you, Scott, it was the most spiritual experience. It was so like, we were so close. We were such a close family and so close to God. And all of us were just moved. And all of a sudden, the rain started pouring and there was actually lightning and thunder and it was the most unusual thing. And right after that, we were actually also, we had to evacuate because it's a tent and there's lightning. And so as we we're about to evacuate, to leave, all of a sudden the storm clears and there's a rainbow and the rain <laughs> makes me cry. The rainbow went around the tent and touched either side, not the tents, the tents, plural. And it went around and touched the ground on either side. And we have a beautiful image of that. And God told us he was with us, his covenant that he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. And this was his work was so evident. It was so evident. And in the lives of the volunteers over the next three days of the clinic, I never heard, as I have at other events, squabbling and arguing and complaining. I never heard it. 
everyone was there, whether it was hot, whether it was raining, whether it was whatever it was, everyone was happy. It was a hundred degrees and humid, 98 degrees and humid. It was humid. crazy, it was crazy. <laughs> but people weren't, people were not complaining. God was working and, and he made it so clear with that rainbow of promise. It's beautiful. It's powerful. And I, I think that our listeners need to know that that same God is with you when you are about his work. Um, you see miracles when you're in mission, when you're on a mission. That's when you see God working and moving in the most powerful ways. Um, the people that were working hard, not complaining, I, got, I have to give a shout out and a praise to God. Because Dr. Lila, you do these gratitude sessions and you, you know, you appreciate the, the civic leaders and this person and that person. And since we've started, you know, we founded this ministry in May, June of 2021, right? We were in the midst of the mandates. We're gathering together with Andrew and Chris Chung, Wyatt Allen, bringing Jonathan Zirkel on a little bit soon after. And then you started saying things like, I want to do these mega events and clinics and these kind of things. And I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. What did I just get into here? And I told you, like, Dr. Leela, you realize I, I that's not my thing. I can't I'm not going to be able to participate in planning events and logistics and all of that. Like folks see me on the screen on our live streams or they hear me as a speaker at our events. And I'm like, guys, I have the easy part. OK, You've got Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert. You've got Kim who organized and ran, your cousin who organized and ran the, um, the, the, the history tour. And I was joking with her. I'm like, thank you so much for everything you're doing. I know all of you guys who really work tirelessly at this. And, you know, I'm just kind of just coming in to, you know, stand at bat for a bit and, and do my thing. And, you know, it's just kind of, I don't have a lot of the responsibility. So I want to give a lot of the praise to God but the gratitude and thanks to those people that actually make events happen. And God gave everybody a part of the body. You know, people are the hands and people are this. And, you know, I, God gave me a big mouth. So that's all I do. But, you know, it's a joy to play my small part and to watch you guys do what you do so well. But take us home to the end of the week. Um, what, where, where, where did we go from there after, after we saw God's marked indication of his providence? So numerous media stations come out. And, you know, we don't do this for the media. That is not the point. There, there's no, you know, oh, wow, the media was here. What wonderful. No, the fact of the matter was, was they recognized that we as individuals are Seventh-day Adventist Christians and that we we literally don't have any, there, there's no strings attached. There's nothing of a financial gain. We want to be Jesus' hands and feet. They know that. We are, our purpose is to fulfill Isaiah 58. And in such a secular environment, to be able to actually say those things to a secular media, to the secular community, it was, it was unprecedented. And the people came out and there were so many stories of it, what, what was so one of the things that was so remarkable to me was that Event DC had told us, oh, most of the people will be homeless and most of the people will be coming in by the metro. Well, we have learned over the many years of doing not homeless. But in this particular event, almost everyone came by car. They are working class poor that have no access to health care really, in, 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 a, in any sort of fashion, because it's a question yet again, do I buy food or do I take care of these much needed aspects of my own personal health? But what they didn't realize when they were coming was that the spiritual aspect of the event was going to be so prominent. We had the Densleys from Charcoal House that were there giving charcoal demonstrations and the people loved it. You should have seen them. They were giving out the charcoal like crazy. I don't know how many people went home with charcoal samples so that they now can use simple remedies at home for the next situation that may arise for them. Our chaplaincy department and our lifestyle department were slammed giving God's beautiful message 
of love. And I would say, Scott, I would say this message is behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him, right? Behold, Jesus is at the door. He wants to give you life and give it more abundantly, not just physical life, but yes, mental, but most importantly, eternal life with him. And that's where things ended in such a beautiful way. We ended our family, our LHA family is strengthened. We are strong to go forward to wherever it is Jesus wants us to go. And I believe that was the most powerful thing that came out of this. And if you don't mind, can I just read a quote? Actually, Scott, perhaps you can read that quote for us. The one that I sent to you this morning. Yes. Yes, read that quote, because I want to encourage our listeners in the power of perseverance by the power of God. As Lucifer sees that we are making efforts to work the cities as if we meant to give the last message, his wrath, Satan's wrath, will be aroused. And he will employ every device in his power to hinder the word. So that controversy calls for this response. Christian life is more than many take it to be. It does not consist wholly in gentleness, patience, meekness, and kindness. These graces are essential, but there is need also of courage, force, energy, and perseverance. So Dr. Leela, I want to close with at least one patient miracle. I know we, we touch so many people's hearts and lives with the gospel and the healing gospel. Um, I want to hear the one about the, the man with the broken leg. And then just take us home with a, with a closing prayer. Absolutely. So remember I said that the tent was going to cut off. If had we not gotten the Department of Building miraculous last minute permit, we were going to lose the radiology department. Well, there was a young man that came in and he was in a, a splint that was, it was just kind of makeshift. You could tell he didn't speak any English. He was actually come to find out he had been fleeing from Colombia, had come up through Mexico, had come to the United States. But in the process of that, he was being attacked and attempted to actually be stolen for human trafficking issues. During the process of this adventure, this horrible situation, he ended up breaking his leg as he was trying to escape, but had never been able to receive any medical care. Well, when he came to the event, he ended up in our legal services department with Mr. Zirkel and Dorothy and a number of other people. And they were helping him deal with some of his issues. After that, he went over to our medical department. He was able to get an x-ray. And lo and behold, they found his fractured leg. He was sent straight from our event over to the hospital that we were working with, which was an unbelievable miracle of God. And he was able to get his leg fixed. He had gone to other medical facilities, but because he didn't have insurance, they had refused him. And so when I found him as he was waiting to be transferred, I walked over to him and in my very broken Spanish, I told him how grateful I was that he had come and I knew it was God's plan. And he told me through a translator that he knew God had sent him to us and that this was exactly where God wanted him to be as he held his wonderful bag of literature in Spanish. I know God blessed so many patients' lives, but God also, with his rainbow of promise, his covenant of love, made it very clear that he was with all the volunteers. And our family, Liberty and Health Alliance, you viewers out there, we are one big family of God, and we cannot wait for what God has in store next. We need to keep asking him. We need to keep asking him to reveal where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do next. We need to ask him for resources, which we're asking you to partner in that endeavor to help cover the cost of this event, but also to cover where God would have this next event happen. And we need to pray that God will give us perseverance, the love of Christ, but perseverance to stand no matter the cost. Let's stand together and have faith in Jesus that he will overcome because he already has. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the miracles that you provided, the clear evidence of your covenant with us, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. 
We ask for your mercy and grace to tell us where and what you want us to do next. We ask for your protection and we ask for your resources to do what you would have us to do. Until we meet again soon, we thank you and we praise you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.